Hi, I'm Jeremy McManus. I am the GM for Investor Relations for Near Metals. Uh, we are an ASX and AIM listed uh, enabler of sustainable battery materials production. Uh, we do that. We've got some novel uh, technologies that underpin three different business units. And all of those business units are a little bit collegiate in that they support decarbonisation and the energy transition. Jeremy, good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Where's the big man? On a plane? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's travelling at present. Good. Okay. Well, I'm sure we'll catch up with him soon enough. But um, some big news out today in his absence, um, which, which uh, maybe gives us a clue as to what he's uh, off to do. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, a battery recycling plant purchase order. That's a big deal. You've been waiting for that. Yeah, we have been. So we're very excited to, to follow through with the formalities on that. It's, uh, you know, we put out an offer, the purchase order we've been waiting for, and it's come through to, to support them to build a plant in Kuppenheim, Germany. Right. Okay. I, look, I, I guess the, the, the clues in the words purchase order, um, but can you just explain the significance of that place? Yep, for sure. Or well, maybe some context. About 18 months ago, we signed a collaboration with Mercedes. And that collaboration was all about working with them to supply them with plant and equipment and to, to help them with the technology to set up a pilot facility in, in Kuppenheim. And, you know, since then, we've been working with Mercedes. We've had a range of purchase orders, and I'll explain that in a second, but essentially to help them with engineering, design, and now with the, you know, the installation of the actual equipment for what is the first half of a two part recycling facility. Right. OK, so you, I think some people are concerned about the, the, the length of time it's taken. Um, were, were you? No, not at all. Um, you know, big company. Um, we can't flex that mus much muscle in terms of timing. We always knew it was coming. They had broadcast it. They'd had a you know, a, a shovel ceremony at the site and started construction, etc. But it's nice to have that formality checked off officially and uh, hopefully give some comfort, you know, to people who are watching. Right. Okay. So you, you've always talked to us in the past about this kind of spoken hub system that you you, you want to you want to kind of set up. But um, to, I, but before we do though, I want to talk about sort of the the engagement with a company like Mercedes, because I know it's it's non-exclusive, right? So in terms of your ability to, um, I guess, sell a product, service or, or goods, you, you, you kind of want to package this thing up with something that's easily digestible um, for that audience. But I think it would also be quite useful for us as investors to try and understand how you package this thing up going, going forward with Mercedes um, and, you know, what the upside is with them, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So essentially, the, the collaboration agreement we signed a while back, you know, talks about supporting Mercedes with, you know, their endeavours to build a pilot facility in Kuppenheim. You know, that's all about Mercedes understanding their entry into this new field for them of, of lithium battery recycling and figuring out how best they might want to scale up with our support and also establishing how to tackle new chemistries and, and things that are five and 10 years out. So the opportunity for us is pretty significant because, you know, obviously it's a, uh, it's a great large brand and the validation from them is huge, but along the journey, they, you know, they help us optimize and scale up, which we were always going to have to do for the refinery section. So this arrangement with Mercedes is for spoke and that's the purchase order that we've just received. But shortly thereafter, that'll be followed with the same for the hub, which is the refinery. So for us, we sit there as a, as a partner learning how they're thinking as a future cell maker about new chemistries, how to make cells so that they can be taken to bits more easily and more safely and how you can uh, recover the constituents to make tomorrow's batteries, which is obviously critical for everyone in that supply chain. Right, and obviously starting, you talked about some of the important um, variables there. Obviously scale is is one of those things that would be important to you. Um, and that's, that's scaling given that the kind of nascent um, position of battery cars, you, you've kind of got to feed this, these, these, these hubs and these, these spokes. So um, 
for Mercedes, that kind of ramp up period, you're starting at what sort of level and expectation to build up to what sort of level? Where's the growth? It's yeah, it's 10 ton a day, this, this facility. So that's 10 ton of batteries going into a shredding circuit that we call the spoke. Let's call it roughly half of that material will translate into something we call a black mass, which is an intermediate product that goes into the refinery. We call the refinery the hub. So you've got a spoke and a hub. And then out of the hub process, which is hydrometallurgy, comes metal salts to make tomorrow's batteries. So that's today. That's smallish. Where we're going tomorrow, or hopefully if we do a good job for Mercedes, is you know, they are going to have commitments to deal globally with, you know, uh, up towards a million tonne of cells by 2030, whatever the number is, their projections for now, but early 2030s. Will we recycle every one of those batteries? Probably not because of jurisdiction and, and transport and logistics, but we're the uh, technology partner in their homeland and you know, looking to do a good job and, and connect with them going forward. So that's that's the opportunity is where they're going in the future and, and being connected to that because they have the feed source. Right. Okay. I guess it's hard to actually put put real numbers on it, but I, I need to understand t- today, this is, you took, you used the word validation earlier, endorsement um, of the the technical aspect of, of this. So that that's great, but um, 10 tonne a day doesn't sound like a lot. And I know you've said it, your expectation is that, that that it grows. So does this thing need to make money today or is this really about proof of concept to allow you to kind of sell, you know, other, you know, packaged goods as it were? Yeah, look, the model for Primobius, we're, we're flexible. So if you're a big customer, then, you know, we're all ears open to determine how best to help. But we'd look to target, if possible, plant supply and installation because we are half owner of the Primobius joint venture is that's exactly what they do and have done for 150 years with a view to licensing the technology. So, you know, the economics gets substantially fruitier to the extent you make this bigger. And that's exactly where end of life and production scraps going. I think everyone's seen all the projections and graphs. So even if you're conservative, there's going to be an awful lot of uh, batteries that need dealing with in a in a safe and uh, you know ethical fashion, but you need big recovery rates, which is what we're all about. Right. Okay. So, look, and I do appreciate that at this moment in time, it's kind of it's kind of hard to put numbers on it, but I I, I need to try and get a, give a sense of you know what it could be um, and how I work out what the economics are. So, um, let me just understand the, the product. Like you say, you you want kind of obviously with because the Primovius contract build sell the plant services but is would it be possible uh or do you expect to actually just sell the technology component you know you'll be dealing with companies with you know billion dollar balance sheets it's it's these are not small companies they'll be just fine but would they prefer to buy completely packaged solutions or are you happy kind of selling part solutions i think we pride ourselves on remaining as flexible as possible because all these OEMs have myriad different needs and their strategies are sitting there, you know, waiting to get played out in the fullness of time. Ideally, we would look to supply and install the plant for the fact that our partner can construct them and then look to license the technology and then their, you know, roll out globally sees us earning royalty income you know, there's lots of benefits to doing it that way. But to the extent that we've got a big customer who would like to cut that structure slightly differently, then of course, we're, we're very open to that. And to the extent that, you know, we joint venture or you know, we build as principal, but the preferred is technology licensing, licensing. And that seems to be what the industry is telling us they need. They really want certainty over raw material supply in the future and having resilience. And if you go down a path where you're purchasing those materials on the market, what if the market doesn't deliver? And that's that's no good for a car manufacturer. So we see this as the sweet spot, but remain flexible. Right, okay, so, so is it, I think you gave us a bit of a clue earlier on when you talked about you know, jurisdiction and, and obviously movement of materials, supply of materials, but and I'm going to show my age here. It's like, it used to be a sort of comparison between, you know, who's going to win VHS or, or beta. 
And, you know, obviously, I think VHS won out in the end. But is this a case of there is only one solution, there can only be one player, or is there room for all of the above um, and with different models in different parts of the world? I mean, are you trying to be, I guess, the only game in town? Uh, no, by no means. I think that's quite unrealistic. It's a huge industry. You need lots of players to make an industry. So not a winner takes all situation, but certainly the method that we're using to extract those metals, which, which some others are using similar hydro metallurgy, it gives you the best recovery. So this is the sunrise approach versus the sunset, which is pyro and burning stuff in a smelter and losing half the material up a stack. Um, and I think the business model that we have adopted is probably different from some of the peer group. I think the two can work in unison. This is going to be a huge sector. So the addressable market, you know, is really, really big, but we remain confident on our business model, if you like, which is going after big companies, not looking to transport and figure out hazardous waste movements across borders, but rather, you know, take material across the fence as it were. Um, and process and return those materials back to the people that are super sensitive about raw material resilience. Okay, and I'll go because one, one final question brings us kind of full circle back to the PO, which is right, you've got the PO, now what? When, when do you get money? What do you do with it? Um, what's the timelines? Yeah, so with this PO for the installation, supply and installation of a 10 ton plant in Kuppenheim for the shredding circuit. Uh, we'll start installing next quarter, so Q4, um, you know, commissioning Q1 of, of next year. And somewhere along that, uh, that pathway, we're expecting the same sort of purchase order for the refinery, and then the two sort of overlap one another. Uh, and we look to supply and construct both for Mercedes and then, you know, happily work with them as, as you know, you have commissioning and ramp up and, and we start to look at where they're going on cell chemistry and production. And also what they're doing longer term in terms of cell production and, and the scrap that's being generated and how they're thinking about end of life, which is the real prize at the end of the day.